Livable urban environments are super important to our quality of life, and while we're working on the transition to electric transportation, a switch that evidence suggests has already had an outsized positive impact on air quality and on the health of people living in urban environments, but which is also taking longer than would be ideal, the other thing that we could work on is travelling less. And one way we could maybe do that is by working from home, something that became way more common during the peak of the Covid pandemic. So should we stick with it? And what impact could we have by maintaining or increasing the shift to work from home? The US has an infrastructure problem, a broad, sprawling, concrete and tarmac covered one. Strodes. If you don't know what a strode is, well, it's something that's not exactly a road, because a, a road is a thing that's used to get rapidly from place to place. And it's not a street, streets being the kind of place that you can gather in and people can move freely about, often in areas with shops abutting them. Strodes are roads that kinda sort of link between places, but they're also kinda sort of trying to be streets with access to stores and neighbourhoods. We've linked to a great video from Not Just Bites on the subject of Strodes right up here. It's a problem that goes back to at least the building of the freeways, to the fact that in built infrastructure terms the US and Canada are young countries. And just to be absolutely clear, because I think it's very much overlooked, there was plenty of infrastructure here before the modern USA appeared. To pick something big at random, in around 1000 BC for example, the Cahokia people cut down around a million trees to build a town for 25,000 people. They surrounded the village with a two mile long stockade composed of 15,000 oak and hickory logs 21 feet tall. That there is some pretty solid human infrastructure. And much of the US infrastructure, unlike many other parts of the world, was built with the car in mind. In Europe, where much of the infrastructure predates the car and was built for people moving around using Shanks Pony, that's on foot for those who missed out on British Slang 101. Or maybe an actual horse if you're moderately fancy. It's easier to see how putting the car back in its box, one of being useful for some things and maybe not so useful for getting everyone to work every single day, is possible. But in the US that's harder to see, because as you stand on the corner of a six lane strode waiting for the traffic lights to change so you can make a headlong dash for the next island of relative safety, if you're on foot it's pretty uncomfortable. And in many places the pedestrian design is downright adversarial. So as we move from the brief period of time where Betelgeusians could believe that the dominant form of life on our insignificant pale blue-green dot is a six foot by twelve foot metal box, to a world in which many are starting to realise that maybe driving everywhere isn't as much freedom as was advertised, we should all consider transition. No, no, not like that. Especially we should consider it if we can get more folks working from home. But I, I kind of think that, that the whole notion of work from home is, is a bit like the, you know, the, 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 the fake Marie Antoinette quote, let them eat cake. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, it's like really you're going to work from home and you're going to make everyone else who made your car come work to the fact, work in the factory. You're going to make the people who make your food that gets delivered that they, they can't work from home. The, you know, the, the, the people that, that come fix your house, they, they can't work from home, but you can. Does that seem morally right? <sighs> It is not like us to rag on Elon Musk. Okay, it absolutely is, but only with good reason, like, you know, when he tweets or is it X is now? Anyway, when he promotes some of his incessant homophobia, transphobia and maybe positive references to a genocidal German leader. I don't have enough time to deal with the utter ridiculousness of his entire argument here, but for example, by his logic, since I'm an ER nurse when I wear my other hat and my career has involved working nights a lot, I still work half of the weekends and it's involved having people literally screaming expletives and literally flinging bodily fluids in my direction. I find it absurd to base an argument on the idea that because 
a job has certain attributes, that everyone else's job should also have those attributes. I mean, sure, if Elon Musk wants to drop by and have me scream expletives at him, I, he's welcome, I guess. But people's jobs are different and have different advantages and disadvantages. That work from home is possible for some jobs and isn't for others doesn't mean that we shouldn't do work from home for those that can. To be clear, there absolutely is an equity piece here, but that sure as hell isn't it. We're also not going to address the fact that he's reportedly advocated against expanding public transport because, and I'm paraphrasing here, he doesn't want to sit next to the pause. Let's just be honest and say that as the CEO of a car company, he may have a teeny tiny vested interest in people continuing to be reliant on the private car. Instead, let's talk more about what a shift to more people working from home or hybrid, sometime in the office, sometimes working from home, might mean for transportation and the environment, and indeed has actually had during the past few years. The restrictions that were enacted rather half-heartedly as an attempt to stop COVID from spreading had a fascinating effect on societal norms, and businesses, after loudly proclaiming how terrible it would be for productivity, found eventually that productivity actually increased with a study from Stanford suggesting that after an initial dip, people's assessment of their own productivity actually increased by nearly 10% above the office baseline. Now that is, to be sure, their own assessment, but there's also data that suggested that coders were submitting more changes to code and call centers were handling more calls per minute. The poor sods, I did that job for a bit and it sucked. Surveys have shown that people continue to work from home when they choose to be off work sick, which I'm not going to advocate for because I think paid sick leave should be an unlimited thing, and I think that earned sick leave is a deeply dystopian concept, and also if you're sick, you should rest. But as an employer, that's got to be a shiny, shiny block you might just have to leap up and grab. Particularly since increasing evidence suggests that as an employer, if you don't grab it, well, removal of flex working options has led large numbers of people to leave their workplace and the threat of that kind of action has people looking for alternative employment. Again, unsurprising since as people's lives have got increasingly complex, being able to work at times when they feel most productive and they can plan their work around their families has meant that many employers feel better able to improve their work-life balance, something they're unsurprisingly unwilling to give up. I've also seen people demanding that if office work is mandated, companies should be paying employees for the time they spend commuting, which sounds fair to me. It ain't time you'd be using for work otherwise. And that's before you even examine the planning rules. In much of the US, that requires a ludicrous number of parking spaces for businesses. There's a great video on that by Climate Town. I'll link to up there and below. Now, you may be wondering why I've addressed that piece first, and that's because I have seen our comments section, and there will be a bunch of people just down there explaining how work from home is a disaster for productivity and that corporations are right to drag people kicking and screaming back to the office. And sure, I get companies' reluctance. Work from home has required new tools, new management techniques, and new ways of working, and there's definitely evidence in both directions regarding productivity. On top of that, companies are tied into long leases on expensive office buildings, and most companies pay their bills. Big empty offices that you have to heat, maintain, and cool, and that don't have anyone in them, must feel like a terrible money suck. But are there environmental and health benefits from working from home? Well, let's start with the impact on energy usage. The research on energy impact is kind of mixed, with some studies suggesting that energy usage goes down with work from home, some suggesting energy usage could actually go up, and some are landing in the middle. And this is a challenging one because a lot of the literature that I've seen assumes that the office space still exists and is still consuming energy. If we could move to a world in which the giant campuses and enormous office blocks are a thing of the past and there are instead fewer, smaller, shared office spaces in which people work some of the time, the potential efficiency gains of work from home might be clearer. 
That said, it's clear that early in the pandemic there were significant energy savings. The IEA reported that overall energy usage dropped around 20% during lockdowns. But where there are the most distinct benefits are in reduced transportation emissions. And despite at least one study showing a quote, rebound effect, where Californians made a bunch of extra short trips around their neighbourhoods, maybe, I don't know, I fancy some avocado toast and a brevet, I'll just pop out and get it. Which most likely led to more cold start short runs in ice cars, the most polluting form of trip. There was also a major drop in rush hour congestion and in overall trips. Going back to those IEA numbers, some major cities saw drops of up to 95% in rush hour congestion, and in New Delhi, average levels of nitrogen dioxide were around 66% lower during the lockdown period. We've seen recent studies that show that traffic-related air pollution has a really significant impact on mortality and morbidity, that's disability and illness, incidentally. Oh, and let us know if you'd like a video on that. And that even small reductions in pollution, such as we've seen from electric vehicle adoption so far, can have outsized impact on improving people's health. As, interestingly, can not commuting. Recent research suggests that longer commutes by private car correlate with poorer mental health. That is, long commutes suck, which anyone who's had one will tell you, and now we're pretty sure they're actively bad for your mental health. Now, the flip side of this energy saving is that it could increase demand for technology. Certainly it meant that many workers who work from home required a work-supplied computer and potentially phone, particularly given some employers' propensity to install spyware on computers. I certainly wouldn't want that on my own machine. If a company wants to log key presses it, well, it shouldn't. But at the very least, it shouldn't expect you to endure that on your own computer that you paid for with your own hard-earned cash. And those computers require connections to the internet and cloud computing, which is an energy-intensive thing. And obviously there's an equity piece here too. Who has the internet connectivity to be able to work from home, even if the company supplies the hardware? Now, some companies have expressed a disinclination to allow work from home because of a perception of worse data security. But let's be honest, every few weeks I get a your data was included in some breach or other letter because most companies aren't actually very good at data security, so it's not a terribly convincing excuse, especially in these days of virtual private networks and high quality encryption. Really, it's just an excuse to hire a damn good sysadmin. But once things settle down, it looks like work from home could lead to a net reduction in carbon emissions. So maybe companies should let people work from home when their jobs make it viable to do so. At least some of the time. We know it has the potential to encourage hiring of a more diverse workforce by allowing companies to employ talented workers from outside their geographic region. We think it can reduce carbon emissions, improve public health, and on top of that, freeing up that office space and road space in the middle of cities could enable the US to rebuild with more walkable infrastructure. Losing those strodes filled with cars for a few short rush hour hours, and making walkable urban spaces with denser housing and green rather than concrete spaces between instead, it has the potential to be incredibly transformative and to be part of moving us to a more sustainable future. And on that note, we're done with today's video. If you liked it, you know what to do, and feel free to let us know your thoughts in our Discord chat room by reaching out to us on Mastodon, or if you're a Patreon supporter, by leaving a comment on our Patreon page. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and our swag store as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling by, on my right, is the amazing list of Charged Up supporters, and shoutouts go to our self-driving tier supporters, Mike Guida, Denny Hyde, Linda Irish, Lance Schall, Mark Eggleton, Cyprian Laplace, John Trammell, Alan Tupper, Chris Maxwell, Brian and Newton, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Sean Tucker, Pedro Mura Pinheiro, Kyle Hodgson, Tony Moss, Brophy Wolf, Kyle Fox, 
Hey Esker, Tesla in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Raging Fellows, Chris Asenta, and Jim Burness. And finally, out of this world, thank you to our top tier supporters, John L. Henderson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, John Lyons, Kevin Burrowbridge, Andrew Glenn, Joe Hughes, David Kitchen, Joe Bresney, Nigel S, Matthew Drobnak, Eric Knack, Paul Conway, Stephen O'Donoghue, JP Fagerback, Reggie Watts, Marcel Ward, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Rory Litwin, Ellery Hensley, Will Graylan, and, of course, Ian. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday over on the main channel, plus Sunday on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day. I'll see you soon, and as always, keep evolving.